All right, so uh, my name is Taylor Karinsky. Um, I'll do my nice intro slide. Um, I'm currently a freelance developer. I also work at a startup here in Omaha called Blazefly. Um, I am a junior at the University of Nebraska at Omaha, full-time student, um, getting a major in IT innovation and a minor in entrepreneurship. Uh, I've got about three years of experience in iOS development, uh, pretty much self-taught. Um, let's see what else. Uh, I've got about six apps up on the store. One of them, hopefully soon, will be Race Note. Um, and I have owned and still own some startups. Uh, one is iTrap, and that's currently live on the store. Um, it's going to help people with uh, trap shooting, if anyone's ever been trap shooting. Um, basically, we're trying to create a standardized platform for digital scoring of trap shooting um, on an iPad. What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and then my happy plate. Uh, we aren't currently doing anything with it, but we have this concept of a uh, an app that will let you scan the barcode of food products for allergies. Um, and then I owned a startup called Activate Innovation for about 18 months um, that did just iOS and Android development on a consultant basis. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about Parse. Um, Parse.com. Has anyone used Parse before? Okay, good. No, but not very many people. Um, I love Parse. I was introduced to it about uh, eight, uh, well, about a year ago, I guess. Um, and it's actually the main system that we're using for iTrap. So that's the database I'm going to show you here in a little while. Um, the reason I wanted to talk about Parse is because I think it can simplify everyone's lives that are here. Uh, it, it provides a ton of tools, and Facebook owns it now, so there's tons of funding behind it, and they're really continuing to develop their tool suite. Um, it was purchased by Facebook in 2013. Um, they have almost 75,000 apps use Parse currently in some form or another. Uh, super easy to start, free account. You don't even have to put in your credit card information. Um, and you only pick the tools that you need. Uh, so if you don't need a database, but you need something to help you with push notifications, Parse is going to be great for that. And it works. They have SDKs and APIs for every major platform, iOS, Android, JavaScript, PHP, uh, a couple other ones that are a little more obscure. Uh, just to show you that they are legitimate, they have quite a few customers. And th this is just like a, a screenshot of their giant list of customers on their website. Um, so there you can see the McDonald's, uh, Warner Brothers, some pretty huge companies are using Parse currently as some of their system. Um, so what I want to talk to you about today is why choose Parse, um, the payment plans that they have in place, the database design and features, and that's kind of a, the biggest portion that I'm going to focus on, uh, analytics, push notifications, social logins, bug reporting, A-B testing, Parse config, and at the end I'm going to go through some code um, from their documentation because it's way better than what I could put together. Um, so we'll just jump right into it. If you have any questions at any point, let me know. Um, I'm going to try to keep this fairly concise and, and short, and I'll leave most of it for questions and stuff at the end. Um, so why choose Parse? I, the first app that I ever made was called Hookah Stop. Um, it's, an, it's an app to look at tobacco flavors and look at reviews and ratings of those flavors. Um, and we had to, we built our SQL database, we built the PHP middleware piece that you communicate from the app to the database and back and forth. And it was a pain in the butt. Um, it took us, that was like a huge part of the issues that we encountered. A lot of the pain and suffering was involved in that piece. Um, so jumping to something like this makes my world a heck of a lot easier. Um, it's awesome because it can tie into all the mobile platforms as well as a website. So iTrap currently, we're using the iOS side. Eventually we'll get on the Android side and then we are also building a website that links with the users that we have in the same exact database um, all really easily. So that's awesome. Simple framework to integrate into an iOS project. Um, just show hands, who's an iOS developer here? Or considers themselves going to be, will be, whatever. Okay, quite a few people. Um, I only do iOS, so I don't have like a lot of knowledge about the Android side, but I would be happy to show you some code on their website. Uh, but anyway, you can just drop it into your project as a, as a simple framework, um, and they have quite a few different frameworks that you can add depending on what you want to do. It's going to speed up development time. I would, rec I would estimate maybe 20 to 30 percent it's going to speed up your development time, and I'll, I'll explain why here in a little bit. Extremely well de well documented, um, so that you can go to their website, click on the section that you are working on, and then they even have like on the iOS side, you can click a simple button and it'll turn all the code on one page from Objective C to Swift. So they have that all set up now, which is great. 
You can even do website hosting through Parse, which I didn't even know until I looked up this stuff for this presentation, so that's cool. Um, they have a cloud infrastructure, huge servers running behind it. They're based out of the actual Facebook uh, office in, in California. And they also have background jobs, so you can run, uh, you know, let's say you want to send a push notification every 24 hours or, or whatever, you can do that with Parse as well. Um, so Parse is really inexpensive and flexible, um, especially for people that are just getting into development or just starting to build their prototype or things like that. So as you can see here, this is just from their website. It's free for up to 30 requests a second, and how I always explain that is you'd have to have 30 users pressing the login button at the exact same time. Um, and that's gonna, it's gonna last you a long time. Um, with iTrap, we hit like .005 requests per second, and we have about 300 users. So um, it's, it's gonna be free for definitely all of your development and early stages of your app, um, which is awesome. And then basically it just goes up. Um, when you hit 40 requests per second, it pushes you to $100 a month, and then every, every 10 after that is an extra $100 a month. Um, so you can really scale it up if you need to, or just kind of leave it small if you're just doing some small project. Okay, so Parse Database is uh, the biggest portion of their services. That's what they started out with as their core. Uh, extremely easy to use graphical interface. Um, it also uh, some, does some really nice things. It automatically generates unique IDs for each object, um, keeps track of created at dates, updated at, um, and then a couple other like security features that you can add as well. Um, it's also a standard relational database object, uh, object, not object, just relational database that you can set up your, um, you know, your keys and such. And then uh, for some reason they call them tables classes. I don't know why, but that's what they're called in, in uh, Parse. And one thing that's awesome with iOS that was a pain um, when we were doing it with a regular SQL database is um, they support uh, all, pretty much all of the major data types that you're going to be sending to the database from iOS. So you can send it a, an NS array as is, and it knows exactly what to do with that. Um, so you can, I mean, I wouldn't recommend storing arrays of data inside of an object of database, but you can. Um, NS data is nice, NS files, so they already have a file stream set up if you want to do images or videos or whatever you may be doing. And then UI images, um, same, same thing, real, real easy to do. Does it work, is it, like, behind the scenes, is it, is it actually a relational database, like, or is it? Kind of, like, yeah. Like, does it also do, like, NoSQL, is it also, like, a NoSQL, like, do they have, like, a NoSQL option, depending on, like, mm -hmm. data or what you want? So, there is no SQL in, in Parse at all. Um, I'll, I'll get to that when we get to the code section. That's, that's what's super nice about it. Um, but, uh, no, there's, you kind of have to set up your relations, but they have all of that code set up if you want to, you know, create objects that relate to each other. Um, so it's it's a little bit more open than a standard SQL database, but um, you, if you need to, you can always set up your relations. Well, I was just wondering, like, is it do they have an option where it's more like a Mongo or? You can. Or it's got um, it, it's object stores. It's all oh, okay. based on yep. object store, but they are relational object stores. Oh, okay. So so it is like a NoSQL database, but with relation stuff. Yeah, built it's like on an top. index DB kind okay. of set mm -hmm. situation. It's got some relation and comparisons, but not. It's a little bit more than Mongo and a little less than a relational database. Okay. So yeah. In the middle. Okay. So that's a good explanation. They also have geolocation objects built right in, which is nice. It stores your latitude and longitude. Um, if you're ever keeping track of your geolocation or geofencing or anything like that. Um, so that's one feature that I actually dove into. Uh, it's, it's pretty nice. And then, um, so some more about the database. They also have a predefined user class, which is really nice. You can create custom classes, custom tables. Um, but the, the user table is really nice because that's also an object that you can pull in your code and it stores you know, everything related to that user right in that one object, which is really nice. Uh, you can do roles and uh, access control list stuff directly in their interface and build it into your code as well. All passwords are encrypted uh, by nature in the user table, so that's another nice feature of the user table. Um, so queries return objects that are similar to like a JSON object or in any form of an object in programming. Um, so when I pull a row from the database, from the parse database, it returns every single attribute 
and I just I can access the ones that I want. I can update the ones that I want, and uh, it's just super flexible, really easy. One new thing that they added this lat maybe like two months ago was core data integration, which is awesome because uh, that's something that we we had a lot of not a lot of trouble with, but it's just kind of a pain to do core data. Um, and if you have to build something that keeps data synchronized between your local app and a cloud database, uh, it can be kind of a pain to do all the checking and uh, equalizing and that kind of stuff. So it actually handles all that. As far I haven't dove into it yet, but as far as I understand, it handles all that. Um, sets up your core data structure, your database inside of your app, and then handles the interaction automatically. So if you add something to core data, it'll automatically push that to parse as long as you have an internet connection, which is great. Um, communicate directly to your app uh, for, or to your data from your native iOS, Android, JavaScript, PHP, depending on whatever you're using, which is great. So instead of having to do an, SQ, you know, an SQL statement, I can literally say get object ID and it pulls me the object um, in Objective-C. So the whole thing is set up so that you don't have to do any more SQL, uh, but you can just write code directly in your app to integrate with the objects and the data that you have in your database. And then a um, nice feature, all classes can be exported to an email address that you have set up with your account. So if you want to do monthly backups or something, it's extremely easy to do that. One feature that I want to point out was save eventually. Um, and I, I did talk about that with iTrap, but it's something that's really nice if you don't have to create like a, a queue anymore to uh, for data that's been offline to push it to online. Um, you just say parse object, save eventually, and it'll as soon as you get an internet connection again, it'll push it up to the cloud. Um, so you don't have to handle building all of that structure, which is cool. And they also have a delete eventually, same, same kind of deal. Um, so another great feature of Parse is analytics. So this is an actual picture of the dashboard that I have for iTrap. Um, it shows you day by day exactly how many users were on there. Um, at, you know, weekly active. It sends me an email like every. I can you know have it send whatever I want, but I get an email every day that says how many people have been on, how many new users, etc. Um, and I'll show you this when we jump over to the website, but. You can see events. Um, you can actually look at your data and see how, like, if you, you can check your users table, see how many people are signing up or leaving. Um, and then it also shows you retention, um, which is really cool. So it'll keep track of which users are accessing data um, from your from your app and provide you, um, you know, percentages to see how many people are coming back and using your app on a regular basis, which is pretty cool. Uh, performance, and that's more related to the parse um, server performance. And then crashes, which I'll get to later, but you can keep track of uh, accurate crash logs directly from Parse as well. Uh, one, one thing that I found Parse to be a lifesaver for was um, push notifications. Um, it, with iOS, you may know you have to create an uh, Apple push notification server a lot of the time, and that can be tedious and difficult, um, and it may not really always be what you want. But Parse lets you do push notifications with basically one line of code um, and then also accept push notifications with one line of code, which is awesome. Um, and then you can also do push notifications directly from their web interface. So uh, basically, easy to you can do scheduling, um, send pushes from users' apps. Um, so like one example is we had a uh, I built an app for a food truck here, and there was the food truck management app, and then there was the customer side, and we wanted the food truck owner to be able to push coupons and codes to their to their clients. Um, so they, we built in a functionality, you pick the code that you want and you hit push, and with one line of code it sends a push notification to whatever user group you want to push it to, um, which is awesome. You can target, target group segments, so instead of uh, being pushed to everyone, if you just want to push to Android users or iOS users or a specific group of emails, you can do that with Parse, which is really cool. Um, yeah, so as an example, you could send a push notification to one person on their birthday, um, just with the power of what is going on behind the behind the scenes. Um, you, you can always push to specific platforms as well. So that's really cool. I uh, a lot of the time, how I would use it probably is to set up um, push notification receiving on the app side, and then in your web portal, you can type up the notifications you want. It even shows you exactly what it's going to look like on their phone. Um, for Android and iOS, and then you just hit push. You can, you know, if you want to send it out later that day or next week or reoccurring pushes, you can always do that too. So, 
social logins. Uh, we've all had to mess with authentication stuff, and um, it's not terribly difficult, but it's not terribly easy either. So Parse handles all of that stuff natively in their SDK. Um, and you can integrate Facebook and Twitter login with just a few lines of code, um, which, is, which is great. You don't even have to do any database interaction. And you can basically store their Facebook and Twitter logins as a PF user in your user table, which is really cool. Um, stores all your tokens and stuff securely, so you actually never see any of that information. Um, it's all handled behind the scenes through Parse. Um, and then they also have pre-built social login view controllers. So if you just are starting out and don't want to build a whole interface with the, you know, say, stay signed in and the reset password and all that, they have those pre-built. So you can just put in a, a login view controller and it'll run right, right from there um, with all the background stuff already hooked up and everything. So uh, believe it or not, Facebook has completely switched over their uh, code structure to use parse objects. So when I, I was going to look at their developer stuff for another app I'm working on, and all of their code examples are PF objects. And uh, I just thought that was a really cool thing that they've, they've they purchased this platform and then they actually are using this platform, which is cool. Uh, bug reporting. So this is something that they just added. There's not a ton of functionality yet, but it's, it's handy. Um, I actually threw it in an app that I'm not using Parse for on anything else. I just wanted to see crash log stuff. So with one line of code, you register the app in your app delegate for um, crash reporting. And then if anything causes your app to crash while any user is using it, it'll send a ping up to Parse, and then you can go and check your crash log. Um, and then you just upload your DSYM file from your project, and it'll give you your actual stack trace that you can view and see exactly what they were doing um, and, and how you can fix it. And then you can always organize your crashes to see which ones have been resolved um, and then you know which ones you still have working and uh, need to work out and that kind of stuff. So really, I know there is some other services that do more than this. Um, Mint is one that I have used that does actual real-time crash logging, which is pretty cool, real-time user data analysis. Um, but I think that they are going to be building out this section quite a bit more over the next couple of months. But they just, they just released it, so it's pretty light. A-B testing, um, I haven't done this personally. This isn't a part of Parse that I've used yet, but um, right now they have A-B testing only set up for push notifications. So you can do like push experiments is what they call them. Um, so you, like if I wanna send a push notification at a certain time and another one at a different time, I can split my user base 50-50 and send a completely different push at a different time um, to those different user groups. And then it'll keep track of all the analytics and uh, responses and stuff like that. Uh, you know, it'll keep track of whether they opened it, when they opened it, that kind of stuff. So you can actually see which push notifications are most effective for your for your segment, which is really cool. Um, like I said, I haven't tested it yet, but I, I hope to here in, in the future. Uh, parse config, this is also something really new, about two months old, um, and I have not used it yet, but it sounds pretty cool. You can, um, so a lot of the time, if you have a minor UI change or need to change a background or uh, you know a specific image or a button or something, that can be a, a lengthy process because you have to go through the Apple review every time you push that update. Um, this can get rid of some of that pain. So instead of having to push a new version, you are creating your configuration of your app in, in, a, in a database. So it'll just register for that when you relaunch the app, pull the content, put it in the image views or whatever you need, um, and then if you need to make a change, you just change that asset in the database and it'll automatically be changed for all of your users, uh, which is pretty cool. I, I haven't tested it yet, but um, sounds like a neat, a neat thing that they're trying to kind of cut down on the amount of updates that you have to push out all the time. Okay, so that's all I have for like content. Um, I want to take you to the parse.com document, uh, documentation. It's, like I said, it's extremely well laid out and I, it would have taken me a heck of a lot longer to put that all together. So I'm going to go ahead and jump there. And we'll go through some iOS code examples. Um, but as you can see, there's just tons of amount, just like a lot of different platforms that they support. Um, Unity, I guess I didn't mention that one, if you guys are game developers at all, uh, which is pretty cool. But So iOS, um, and then obviously Mac as well. Uh, but we'll just start at objects. 
um, really simple, basically in the exact same form that you would use a JSON object or an NS um, dictionary um, where you're saving um, key value pairs, essentially. So to create a new object is as simple as PF object, object with class name, and you're basically just registering that object for a table. And then you put in, um, these are your attributes here, attribute names, and then the values. Um, and, and then basically it's as simple as saving background, and it'll automatically save that object that you are trying to create. And like I said, it, it does create, like right here, it gives it a randomized object ID, so you're never gonna run into multiple object IDs that are the same. And then created at, updated at, which are actually re really nice to have, because um, every, time, every time a user pulls an object or pushes an object, it'll change that updated at, which can be helpful in certain situations. It's great advice for any developer on any platform. You should always store those signs. Yep. It will automatically for you. It'll save you so much time in the end, because one day you're going to run into an issue, and that can really help. I would agree. OK, so retrieving um, queries are really pretty easy. You're just creating a query with the class name um, that you want to pull from. And then get object with ID. There's all sorts of different ones that you can use. Um, you can set like, let's see. Um, okay, it may go. I might go into it later. Oh yeah, there's a query section. Um, but anyway, queries are real easy. Instead of having to write a you know huge inner join and all that stuff, um, basically you just say I want this object with these parameters, and it'll pull an NS array of all the objects that you want associated with those. Um, let's see. So these are the three special values, um, and you access those a little bit differently than you do your attributes that you set up. So the attributes you set up, you do with this uh, bracket structure and the name of the attribute. But because parse have these natively built into their objects, you just access it with the dot structure. And then um, refresh is super cool too. So instead of having to resave every time or delete, update, you know, et cetera. You can change the things that you want and then just hit object refresh and it'll update the object that you're using in your native code currently as well as the object in the database. Um, so with that two word thing, you can update your object in the database, which is really cool. Um, and then local data store stuff, this must be the new, I haven't messed with this yet, but this must be the new um, core data structure. Um, from local database. Basically, the queries are all going to be very similar to pulling from the actual parse services. And then here's your saving objects offline, um, your save eventually function. So you can build it and then just push it to the queue. And as soon as you get an internet connection, it'll push it up automatically. Um, you know, same with same with updating objects. You can pull the pull a query for that one specific object, update it, and then save in the background very easily. Do you know how it handles like conflicts, I guess? If we if you're doing offline stuff, you would access something from like the web and your app and maybe your app hasn't saved like pushed it yet. Yeah, I'm not um, honestly I'm not sure because I haven't I haven't messed with the the core data stuff, but um, I guess if you're able to access an object, then it theoretically should have already pushed it um, because it's queued and it'll, even when your app is in the background, it'll still push that object as soon as you get internet connection. Um, so if you're opening your app and trying to pull, it's likely that the queue is already ran to push all your objects up. So I have never encountered any of those conflicts, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really sure. Uh, you can do counters. And then uh, uh, here's an example of arrays, uh, which is really cool. I have used it a little bit, um, basically, just shows an array inside of your uh, attribute. Deleting objects, very easy. Remove an object for a specific, uh, you know, specific username. And then here's your relational stuff. So you can create, um, let's see. So you're creating an object here. Create the post and it, like a uh, from this is like a blog example. So you have a comment and a post on that comment, or a post and then a comment on the on the post. Um, so you can always um, and then the the relation between post and comment is the parent attribute, and then you just save the comment 
and it'll save the post with it as well. And how, how, I, how I do it currently is um, basically just create like associative tables. Um, so you'd have uh, one class here, one class here, and one in the middle that has both their object IDs and you can access both sides. So you can always do that as well. Conflicts are handled. You have to handle conflicts yourself. Hmm. There's a question on that board. Oh, okay. They have, apparently you can write handlers before things save on the web, on the web side and you need to create your own handler on the web side. Um, they just, uh, they just update. Last in, last out. So if you update, you updated something on the phone offline, then updated on the on another phone or on the web online, and then the phone finally sent the update, it's going to overwrite hmm. the existing update. Interesting. Oh, it's not. It's going to the last one to actually yep. send the update wins, not the last one to actually do the update. I. It just says that last in wins. I'm not sure if it looks at those updated timestamps and realizes That'd be like very helpful. Yeah. that it. Fails on it would think they look the last up. Yeah, that's what I would think. Yeah, yeah. But probably do the set time stamp. Uh, yeah, definitely. You have, a, you have a before update handler that you can oh, write okay. on the website and tell cool. it what to do. And that's how they say to handle conflicts. Okay. So they're looking into a more intelligent way to handle conflicts <laughs> across the board. Okay. I mean, conflict handling is a problem. Well, that's what, as soon as they said off, the offline thing, yeah. I was like, well, how do you handle Yeah, like there's no way to handle conflicts. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> like hmm. automatedly exactly. across the board. Yeah. Business logic. So. Interesting. Um, okay, so data types, you can do NS numbers, NS strings, date, data, NS array, dictionaries, null objects, uh, which is super cool because normally you'd have to convert those into a string or some more standard data type. Oh, yeah. I haven't done any Swift yet, so. I mean, this is, I mean, it's fairly readable as is, but, um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a lot more simple, that's for sure. Objective-C can get pretty, uh, pretty bracket heavy. Were Objective-C developers are and have done Swift and, like, have, are looking at doing Swift, like, more permanently? Yeah. And I've done back to Swift, which is weird. You went back. I love the brackets, honestly. I like the brackets, but no problem. Um, and then I'll, I'll show you some queries. This is kind of what a query structure would look like. So you create your query object, and then you add parameters to that object, basically. So where key is equal to this, or less than this, or you know, whatever you want it to be. Um, and then you just run the find objects in background and it returns an NS array with anything that matches those, the, that query basically. So very easy. There's a couple different ways that you can do, like you can do a predicate or yeah, predicate in, instead of uh, like a where key is equal to if you want to do it that way. Um, so here's, here's some other things that are supported by queries. You can do not equal to greater than, less than. Oh, you can also set the uh, limit on the amount of objects that are coming back. So if you only want five or 10 objects, you can just set the limit on your query. And you can also, and you can also pull first object that it finds that's uh, similar to the query that you're looking for. You can skip 10. You can skip a, a, a number. So if you want the uh, you know, next, you know, next section, basically you can pull the next section. You can order the different ways that you want. You can order by um, specific attributes, which is pretty cool. Um, there's some examples of the different less than, less than or equal to. Oh, and then you can also create an NS array of things that you either want to find or things that you don't want to find, which is pretty cool. And then you just add that to your query, and anything that's contained within that array will be part of your uh, your constraints not contained in where key does not exist pretty much takes care of all of the major functions you'd use in an SQL statement so but like like I said all of this is just a native objective C instead of having to write a couple different pieces of scripts or, or whatever it may be you can just do it directly from your Android iOS you know whatever you're working with 
um, which in turn cuts down time because then you can just kind of keep going, pull your objects and work with them and then send them back and you don't have to worry about you know, learning a whole different language or whatever it may be. Um, uh, there's all kinds of stuff here. Like, like I said, this documentation is just, it's, it's huge. Um, some of the Facebook, well, here's the user. So let's do uh, push notification stuff first. So you just add a couple lines. Oh, that's local data store, sorry. Um, basically, you just add a couple lines in your app delegate that registers the app for, is this the what? Oh, it's just a tiny, so, okay, I see. Um, so there's a separate section here. But you just register the user for the uh, for getting pushes. Um, basically, you create this PF installation object, which gets stored along with your user and your user table. And, uh, and you register for remote notifications. And then that's pretty much it. Um, you can set like channels, groups, um, that kind of stuff. So if you want this particular user to be in a small group that you send pushes to, you can do that kind of stuff, which is pretty cool. Does it have the ability to trigger pushes from the web based on criteria? Like a user use your app three times, send them a push notification? You know, I'm not sure on that one. Um, I know you can do like schedules. Um, so every certain amount of time you can send this group a push notification, but I, I guess you'd probably have to build your own piece of software that would check how many times, like if you want to send based on how many times somebody's used your app, it's definitely possible, but I think you'd have to build your own. Um, yeah, you the cloud, okay. Okay. I haven't... I haven't messed with the cloud code part of it yet, but I, we were talking about that before. It sounds like uh, the more of like custom configuration of the actual server itself. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, if you were, like to, in your example, he, if you wanted to know how many times they used the app, then every time they used the app, mm -hmm. you'd yes. be sending something up to our side. So right. you, you could just set a handler and like, run that object. And okay. And then from there, and then if it's three times, then you can send a push right from there. Okay. Cool. You like, still use your own push keys and the whole thing, right? You have your own. Like, they handle it all. Oh, so you don't even need push keys or anything? No. To Basically, to you add this to your app delegate, it registers their device, adds it to their system, and then it's ready to get a push notification. You, you want certificates, right? I'm talking about the certificates, yeah. Like oh, you do still have to, yes. Certificates, yes. Certificates yes. And all that kind of stuff. Okay. Yeah, so you, you up, basically you upload, like I think it's like a .p12 file or something. Okay. Um, you upload that to here and turn on push notification, and that's really it's it. pushing as you use. Yep. So if you ever decide you want to move off of parse, you can and push yep. the same way. Okay. Yep, definitely. Um, I just, uh, I had a good experience with this push system. It would have been, at the time, it would have been really difficult for me to set up a server and kind of figure out all that stuff. So this was <coughs> really handy for me to just send push, receive push, etc. You can also send data along with your push, um, which I don't know. I can you do that currently with the Apple's push notifications? Uh, yeah, I mean, like, if you can do it from here, you can do it from okay. Apple, too. I mean, that's all they're, they're actually using Apple's. They're oh, okay. Giving you a layer gotcha. Of but I, uh, one thing, I mean, if you get a push and it has some data in it, you can run a, cert, you know, run a service based off the data that you receive, which is pretty cool. Um, and then, let's see. Okay, so we're still back here. So here's your user table. Um, user name, password, and email are natively built into a PF user object. So you don't even have to set those up when you create a PF user. Um, logging in is one line of code, and it does the whole secure transfer token stuff all, all on its own, which is cool. You can also do email verified. So Parse will handle the sending an email to a new user to verify their email address. It handles all of that interaction, which is really cool. I would. Stay there or is this restful, do you know? I'm not sure. I would guess that it's session based, but I'm not sure. Um, 
So once you actually log in a user, you can access the a PF user object and you can just get the current user. Um, so you can always have access to anything that is stored inside of your PF user object. You can always have access to that at any place inside of your code, which is pretty cool. Um, Yes, objects. you can do uh, ACL and also roles. So they actually have a full class dedicated to roles. So if you want them to only access certain content or have, like we did it with um, ITRAP, so that certain people only have certain levels of subscription service. Um, and you can just do that on a role basis, which is pretty cool. And then the, the ACL stuff as well, so. Uh, anonymous users, if you want people to just kind of have their own information, but you don't want to provide email, password, that kind of stuff, you can do that. Um, so here's the roles stuff. So you can set them as like an administrator or a user, that kind of stuff, and you actually define your own roles. So. And you can, you can set the ACL stuff for any objects in any class that you have. Facebook user stuff. Um, so you, you get a, a parse ID, parse client ID, which you have to do anyway when you set up parse in your app. Um, but this sets up all of your uh, Facebook session token stuff, authentication stuff. Um, and then you can do the login, sign up. I haven't actually built this into anything that I've done yet, so I'm, I'm actually, you probably will be with the, here within the next month or so. So we'll see how it goes, but I, it should be fairly simple. Reauthorize user, um, is linked with user, that kind of stuff. Same with Twitter. And I know both, both Twitter and Facebook have some built-in iOS code already. Um, so I don't, I don't know if there's an advantage to using parse over the native code that Apple provides currently, but um, in terms of keeping track of all of your user data in one table, it's, it'd, it'd be pretty nice. And then uh, the cloud stuff, I haven't done anything with this cloud stuff, but this would kind of be where you would set up your functions that you can run in, on the server itself. And there's a whole guide to that cloud part of it. Uh, Geopoints, so they're already set up. Uh, if you want to create a PF Geopoint object, you just add the latitude and longitude. Uh, you can even get like the current Geopoint of their device without having to do the Apple's uh, CL location stuff. Geo queries you can do within five miles, within a radius, uh, pulling objects, That's that'll be pretty handy. Um, Within GeoBox from southwest to northeast, so you can create a geofence basically and pull objects related to that geofence. And then here's where we get into the UI stuff that they currently provide. So they have this view controller completely set up with all the background handlers and everything ready for you to do everything that you see on that page without you having hardly to do any code. So that's pretty cool. Um, I, I did use it for a couple uh, like test projects that I was doing and stuff like that. You can kind of customize the fields that are available. So if you want to get rid of password reset, you can get rid of password reset, that kind of stuff. Uh, you can customize your logo for all that stuff. Um, and app purchases, this is something that I haven't seen before. Hmm. Interesting keep track of purchases in your database. Okay, so I'm gonna jump over to, that's pretty much the main things that I wanted to show you from the documentation. I'm guessing Android is very similar. Uh, if we jump over, I'm sure it's just a dot structure instead of uh, your brackets, basically. Um, so yeah, you're doing a, a parse object, dot put, very similar stuff. Uh, okay, so I'm going to jump over to the actual database that I have for iTrap, just so you can see some of these features live. So here's the interaction. Um, today we had eight daily active users, um, 188 total users. You can see, now this shows you your requests. 
So like I was saying earlier, you can see, uh, let's see, app opens, like all kinds of different stuff that you would normally have to build in yourself or build a nice you know, uh, view for. Um, but the, the request is nice to keep track of because I believe even, even though it is a 30 request per second for free, I think um, they still limit you at a million a month, I'm pretty sure, which is every time you pull is one, every time you push is one. So um, you can keep track. Like on our, on our biggest day, we had 10,000 total requests. Um, and I, at some point somewhere you can see, I can't remember where it is, but you can see like the exact uh, how many requests per second you're getting. So even at 8,000 requests for that day, it was like one or two requests per second, uh, which is significantly far away from 30 requests a second. So, uh, And then you can see like your data stuff. So user count over time, it's you know steadily increased, that kind of stuff. Um, retention, so it says here, of the one users who signed up on January 13th, one of them were active on January 16th, that kind of stuff. Um, so that's kind of cool. Performance, I'm pretty sure, is just like your, oh, here we go. So here's your uh, request per second. So like here was point zero point one three three requests per second. So even on some of our biggest days, okay, 4.2, um, but basically it gives you an idea that you could use this for quite a while without having to pay for it, which is pretty cool. And then here's your crash log stuff. I don't think I have it implemented on this account, but basically it'll just show you a list of any crashes that have come up, and then you can go view their stack trace and everything. Um, and then I'll show you the actual tables, what they look like. So here's, uh, here's your user table. Uh, I mean, set up any kind of stuff that you want in there. And then you can, only, uh, you can filter through your data any which way you want to see that um, in any, any case. So basically it just gives you an idea of what it looks like. Pretty nice graphical user interface. Add class. You can import stuff from other database services if you've used other ones. Basically just a CSV file, I'm pretty sure. Um, cloud code, jobs. I haven't done any of this kind of stuff. But like your config, this would be where you set up your content that you can push directly into your app, that kind of stuff. So um, that's pretty much what I had. Um, I just wanted to kind of let you guys know that although Parse may be known for their database stuff, they have tons of other tools. And if you just want to use one thing, you definitely can do that. And there's no penalties or you, know, you don't have to put in any credit card information or anything. Um, it was great for me to get set up. It helped me learn about the relational database structure itself, that kind of stuff. So um, I guess anybody have any questions? Um, I guess if you're going for like a, a real big user base, it could get real expensive really quick. So that's something that we're going to have to keep in track keep kind of in touch with the, for ITRAP. As it, like right now, we only have 200 people, but if there's 20,000 people, you know, I don't know how quickly that's going to ramp up to where we have to start paying a significant amount. So like eventually you're going to need your own, your own thing. Yeah. People have used parts forever. I kind of feel like it's a, it's a good starting point, but Definitely. as time goes on, you're going to have to switch how they're feeling it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't know when you're right, though. Like you just yeah, I know. You, like, you, you just pay it down, right? <laughs> yeah, like, you just like, like Instagram paid down, um, yeah. you know, Everything was like out of service, and they just, eh, it's fine. And they just sold for a billion dollars, so huh. it is. I, I, it's definitely gonna be a price thing, but that's a good problem to have, right? I yeah, that's true. I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I do what I do. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Your, your, pay, your pay structure, so that actually fits. Yeah, so definitely. You, figure, you said you're at like 300 users, that's cool. Yeah. At four requests a second peak. Yep. So you got an order of magnitude before you got to hit 100 dollars, right? So oh yeah. And even at and even at that, 100 dollars. Isn't terrible. Yeah, hundred dollars a month is not cheap, but it's definitely a if you price right. You have three thousand paying users. You should be able to. Yep. And it'll ramp. So that's the problem. Is if you're gonna leave Parse, you're gonna have to rebuild some of your code in your app to handle. I mean. 
that if you stick with this, you can use their nice code platform. If you don't stick with this, yes, it'll export as a standard database file. Um, and you can put that in any SQL database or anything like that. But the code that you have in the app is not necessarily going to work. But so. Sparse also has an API interface, too. Yes. So theoretically, if you wanted to use Parse and think you're going to move, you could just interface with their API. And, yep. and then you can just re-implement their API from your yep. out, which would make it easier. But I think some of the advantages of the parse is that you just take their library and move yep. right through it, and maybe a lot of time, yep. you know, probably not worth your time to just put an interface right with their API, but, which is nice, though. Like, if you do that, yeah. do anything else, you're going to interface with an API. Yeah, like, uh, for, you know, for iTrap, we have the, uh, the database that we have, and we're right now we're building a sec. Well, we just have kind of a front end web page right now, kind of telling people about the product. But uh, we want people to be able to log in and see analytics of their data, see the you know, you know best shooters, print out logs and reports, and they're able to do. Our web developers are able to do that all with Parse API um, or the the REST API. So it's really nice because it's a, the, the exact same data structure, and we're just accessing it in ways that make it most efficient for every part of the development team, which is really cool. Um, anything else? Can I have a question? Yep. Uh, when you were when you first set up your your what they call class so table. Yep. You just like you named the table and then you said this field and then what you're storing there. Yep. Is it setting up the field right there? Yeah. Like you didn't reference, you didn't set up your table ahead of time before you put the object in. It's just saying, oh, okay, you're finding a new field. Here's a new field set up in your table. Yes. Okay. Um, so you can either set up. Well, you could do both. You could set up the table. Um, you could, do, I mean, so you could set up the table and name it and just leave it as is. And as soon as you push an object with attributes that aren't there, it'll actually fill those in automatically. Um, or you can set them up before and just use the attributes that you've already set up. Be careful with spelling. That's one thing that I ran into because if you spell it wrong, it's going to create an entire new column that you didn't want in the first place. So, like even like capital and lowercase, I ran into that a couple times. So that was one thing. Yep. What do you have to set up for that? Like, do you, do you have to set it up in your app delegate? Um, as long as you have the parse framework in, installed on there, um, push notifications, you do have to like register. Uh, there's like a, a register section where you set up the installation of the push notification service. Uh, but for save eventually, that's just a code, a line of code that they have available. So you don't have to do anything special for that. Awesome. Um, so for up to 30 requests a second is free. Push. For push stuff? No. Nope, that's totally free. So, I mean, it's part of your requests that you use. Um, so every push you use is a request, every pull you use is a request. But it's, uh, they don't charge like a separate fee for the push notification stuff. So if you have a, say you have like a thousand users and decide I want to push something to every user, does it kind of spread that over time? Um, <laughs> oh yeah, I guess I don't know how that works. Yeah, it must spread them, right? I guess it does. Yeah, I don't. I'm not sure how that works, honestly. Okay. I've never had to push a push well, notification know, like, to a bunch of people, so. Like, oh, hundred bucks. <laughs> That's how they make their money, actually. Is that wait for you. They only make one push to every user. And maybe maybe push notifications aren't part of the request then, because that wouldn't. I don't know. I'm not sure. Right. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I don't know. I guess that's a good question. I'm not sure how that works. But uh, they do, like I said, they have a nice graphical interface for pushes on here. So you can draft up all your stuff, save them, schedule them, that kind of stuff. So. Is iTap uh, subscription based? Sort of. Um, there's different tiers. So you, right now you pay based on how many shooters you're, you're going to have on your team. Um, the top end is like 29 bucks uh, for unlimited users. But uh, we're working, once we get the analytics side of the website done, so here's the, here's the current website. Um, and right now you can just log in and view your account details, purchase a new subscription, that kind of stuff. Uh, not, I guess not subscription yet, it's a one-time fee. 
Um, but once we get the analytics portion of it done, where you can print out reports, view all the stats and everything, we're going to start charging um, yearly or bi-yearly, just because of the way the trap season works. It's only about four months at a time at different points throughout the year. So um, we're just going to kind of charge by season, basically. And this isn't going to load, so. Itrap.com tickets? Yep. We tried. It was this nice lady, not very nice lady, um, <laughs> from uh, like California or something, and she had it and had no idea what it was going to be used for, and she wanted like 600 bucks for it, and we just like, not worth it. So, but I, I like itrapshoot.com. It's also itrapshoot.com. We have both of those. So, um, but uh, yeah, this was definitely my kind of cornerstone um, setup for Parse. Um, this would have been extremely difficult without Parse because of the amounts of data that we're pushing. And you can have, um, like, Mount Michael, this small team that we started developing this for, they had 11 shooters. And they, with, by the end of their one season, they had 30,000 records on paper that were handwritten. So in terms of the app, when we have five or 600 people on a team using it, that can stack up significantly. And it would have been pretty hard to manage with a, a regular system. So Parse was very helpful with that. Um, and then, like I said, there's the, uh, hopefully within the month, there will be a beta version of the, uh, the analytics portion of that, so. Um, is there tooling involved for like, developing on the web, or is it, is it really more valuable for you know, iOS or Android? I would say you could use it, I would use it for anything. Like, we're using it for that website. Um, and yes, we are pulling data that you set up in the app, but. They have JavaScript for it. Yep. JavaScript, PHP, uh, REST, H, uh, REST API, that kind of stuff. And a quick question on the push notification. Yep. Is there the ability to do a push to set? Um, I don't think so. Like push to an SMS message? Yeah, or push to uh, email? I, d I don't think so. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm not sure. I was curious. So the push notifications are specifically for. Yeah. Yeah, if you want to do SMS, I, th I know there's there is some services out there that are kind of set up to help you do SMS pushes to people, um, but that's not. I don't think that's currently built into Parse stuff yet. So, Thanks. yep. Am I on time? Yep. Awesome. Well, I uh, appreciate the time. I hope that you guys can at least check this out, go through the documentation, see if anything could be useful for any of the projects you're working on right now. Um, I preach this stuff. I could probably be the, the salesperson for Parse. So, um, yeah. Thank you.